This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you something that maybe you already know. The fact that America's favorite wine is port wine. Did you know that? If you didn't, you'll know why port is the way out front favorite if you'll just sample some Petri California port. You just look at that Petri port and you know it's good. That wonderful, deep, rich red color. And Petri port is so clear. Just hold it to the light and you can sort of see right through the glass. But what you want to know really about a wine is how does it taste. And I'll tell you something. I've never yet been able to find the adjective that'll do Petri port justice. It's wonderful, honest. You've just got to taste it for yourself and find out for yourself. You'll love that Petri port in the evening after dinner when you're sitting around listening to the radio. And it's perfect to serve your friends when they come over. You can show them that Petri label, too. In fact, you can show it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now for our weekly doctor's visit. Let's see... No, 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 Mr. Bartell. Don't say let's see if he's expecting us. (laughs) You know, I always expect you this time on Monday evenings, my boy. So draw up your usual chair and settle down. Thanks, Doctor. Ah, that's it. Ah, All alone this evening, Doctor? Where are the puppies? Out on the patio. They had a most unfortunate encounter with a dead seal on the beach this afternoon. In consequence, they're a little uh, malodorous, shall we say. (laughs) In that case, Doctor, perhaps we'd better change the subject. So, suppose I ask you about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, my boy, as I told you last week, the story took place in the foul alleyways of Limehouse. It was there on a foggy December evening in 1890 that my story began. An old friend and patient of mine, Isa Whitney, had disappeared, and his distraught wife had come to me for help. Knowing the man to be the victim of the shocking habit of taking opium, I suspected that I might find him in one of the vile dens inhabited by the dregs of the waterfront. And so, Mr. Bartell, about five o'clock on that December evening, I began my search. After an hour of fruitless wanderings, I found myself in a vile alley called Upper Swandham Lane. I could hear the distant moans of the river boats as I walked, eyes alert, and hand on the revolver in my coat pocket. Suddenly, I saw a steep flight of steps leading down to a black gap, like the mouth of a cave. I walked down. The steps were worn hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of stumbling feet. I reached the bottom. A door faced me, and above it, a flickering oil lamp winked warnings at me. I found the latch and lifted it. The door squeaked open protestingly. And I entered. There was a tinkle of Chinese wind bells as I walked towards a long, low room. A strange sight met my eyes. Through the gloom, thick and heavy with the brown opium smoke, I saw that the room was terraced with wooden berths, like the forecastle of an emigrant ship. Out of the shadows, there glimmered little red circles of light, now bright, now faint, as a burning poison waxed or waned in the metal pipes. Bodies lay in strange... Fantastic poses, bowed shoulders, bent knees, heads thrown back. The attendant came up to me with a pipe and beckoned me to an empty berth. I haven't come here to smoke your filthy drug. I'm looking for a friend, Mr. Isa Whitney. No, Mr. Whitney here. Well, I'm going to search the place. You must not disturb the place. I'm carrying a revolver, so you'd better not argue with me, my good man. Out of the way. I searched that filthy den but found no trace of my missing friend. As I was leaving despair, a long shaking hand reached out and plucked at my sleeve. 
I turned, and there sprawled in a berth was the wreckage of a man. His gaunt face yellow and twitching, his clothes filthy and ragged, and the pupil of his eyes like pinpoints. He spoke to me in a thin, quavering voice. Sir, for heaven's sake, get me out of here. Now, look here, my man. Don't say you won't help me, Governor. Ain't you got out? Please help me, Governor. Take me out of here. Stop your pink. I'm going to bomb you, I tell you. Oh, what must you expect if you indulge in this filthy habit? Take me out of here, Governor. I'll go straight this time. Cross me out, I will. Oh, very well. Come along with me. I suppose it's my duty to help you. Ah, oh, bless you, Governor. Here, you are. Here now, give me your arm. You cannot take him away. He owe me money. That's a bleeding lie. I paid him when I come in, I did. He cannot go with you, mister. You remember what I said about my revolver, you blackguard? If I have any more trouble with you, I'll, I'll fetch the police. Come along. He owe me money. He owe me money. Infernal scar owe me money. You tell him all proper, Governor. I'd hope you didn't. Now, look here, my good man. I'll give you a square meal, some advice, and some medical attention. But the rest... Never mind the advice, Watson, but I'll take you up on that square meal. Holmes! Yes, I'm very glad to see you, old fellow. What brought you to that filthy den of iniquity? Oh, gracious me, I want to find a friend. And I, an enemy. (laughs) Your disguise is wonderful. It completely fooled me. But I'm afraid the proprietor was beginning to penetrate it. That's why I staged the little rescue scene. Had I been recognized, my life wouldn't have been worth an hour's purchase. How long had you been there? Why were you there? Come on, Holmes, tell me all about it. With pleasure, old chap. But first, let's find a a chop house. I want that square meal you promised me. Excellent meal, Watson. Yes, you're surprisingly good for such a shoddy-looking place. Well, Holmes, now perhaps you'll tell me what you were doing in that opium den. I've already told you my story. I'm shadowing a most unusual criminal. A man who haunts the opium dens. And yet I know that he himself is not an addict. Well, I don't see anything very criminal about that. He might be looking for a thrill, or perhaps he's one of those writer fellows or something. But this man pretends to be an addict. I watched him closely. He fakes his smoking. And grease paint has enabled him to simulate the characteristic pallor of a drug victim. He even affects the typical mannerism of nose scratching, but it's his eyes that give him away. Well, the pupils are wide open, I suppose. Exactly, old fellow. Whereas, if he were really addicted to the drug, they would, as you know, be contracted. I myself always treat my eyes with a special, well, a special kind of drop on the occasion when, uh, well, I have to enter these dens. Well, why does a man haunt an opium den in order not to smoke? That, my dear Watson, is the problem that I intend to solve. Well, perhaps the fellow's a policeman or a private detective like yourself, Holmes. I've already checked on those possibilities. No, Watson, I believe there is only one answer. I believe the man is planning a murder. A murder? It's a tempting setting for a murder. Your victim is an addict, drugged and helpless. Your witnesses... They're in an equal state of befuddlement. The proprietor is anxious to cover up the crime because of the police. But you. Yes, sir. Now, the question is, who is the intended victim? That, my dear Watson, is why I've been shadowing this man. Unfortunately, he was not present in the den we just left, but I intend to continue my search. Holmes, uh, can, can I help you? My, my wife's away, you know. You know, it's a long time since we were on a case together. I should be delighted, my dear chap. I've missed you sadly during the past few months. And I, you, Holmes... What's the next move? Back to Baker Street, old fellow. My disguise is wearing thin, and I must contrive a new one. New disguise, eh? Well, which one shall it be, Watson? Well, how about the old flower seller? <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> well, it's pretty fresh, <laughs> well, it's... <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 my dear fellow, no. Hardly appropriate for an opium <laughs> dinner. In any case, the clothes are so wretchedly uncomfortable. Well, how about the music hall singer? Oh, that chap, yes. Oh, I don't want to be beside the seaside. Oh, I don't want to be beside the sea. I don't want to stroll along the prom, 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 where the brass band plays tiddly. I'm oh, confounded. Who can that be? <laughs> you weren't expecting anyone, were you? No. So this is just like the old days. The doorbell ringing, Mrs. Hudson toddling off, and bringing up some poor devil in trouble, and... Say that rather wistfully, old fellow. Don't tell me that you repent of marriage. No, of course not, Holmes. Mary's a perfect darling, and I couldn't be happier. Just the same. <laughs> it is rather fun to be back here again. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, it's a gentleman, sir. He gave me this card. Says he's very anxious to see you. Hmm. Wayne J. Layton, President, Layton Corporation, Chicago, United States. Ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Aye, sir. Well, it's quite the cold times to see you back here, Dr. Watson. That's just what I was saying myself, Mrs. Hudson. Hmm. Mr. Layton has scribbled a message on the back of his card. 
If a thousand pounds for a week's work interests you, you'll see me. A thousand pounds? Big fish, Watson. Very big fish. Uh, this way, sir. Uh, thank you. Oh. How do you do, Mr. Layton? I guess you're Sherlock Holmes. You guessed correctly, sir. Excuse me. Oh, Mrs. Hudson, just a moment, Mrs. Hudson. Hi, Mr. Holmes. Sit down, won't you, Slayton? My name's Watson, Dr. Watson. I'm Sherlock Holmes' colleague. Uh, yes, I've, I've heard about you, too. I uh, like a cigar, Doctor. It's a good one. Sent me back three shillings. Oh, three shillings? Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Just put one. Oh, no, three I think you yourself. Oh. Splendid. And now, Mr. Layton, may I ask what brings you here? I'll talk fast and to the point. I'm a businessman. I like to do things in a business way. I have a chance to control the guano deposits of the Republic of San Pedro. Their minister will be in London tomorrow, and if it weren't for one thing, I know that I could swing the deal and get the concession. And what is that one thing, Mr. Layton? The deal is secret, see? I thought no one knew about it, but when I got here, I found out that my biggest business rival has gotten wind of what's going on. He's an Englishman. I've never met him, but uh, he's right here in London. Now, I'm not going to tell you his name, not until you give me your word that you'll work for me. Just what you wish me to do, Mr. Layton. Get this rival of mine and keep him out of circulation for a week. I don't care how you do it, and I won't ask. In a week's time, I'll give you the other half of this 500 pounds I brought with me. Oh, good, Scott. What kind Sir of effect Watson, give you... Mr. Layton his hat and gloves. That's it. Thanks, old fellow. Goodbye, sir. Uh, what are you doing, throwing me out? I can't think where you uh, gathered the impression that I indulged in kidnapping. Once again, goodbye, sir. And here, sir, you can take back your cigar. Well, if you don't want some easy money, I'll soon find someone else that does. This is the last you'll see of me, Mr. Holmes. Life is full of little consolations. Hmm. Some people seem to think that money can... Watson, buy... the game's afoot. Mr. Layton is the man I've been seeking. The man who pretends to be an opium smoker. Why, well, that you let him get away. Here, I'll go after him. No, 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 no. Don't worry. I've already arranged for that. Oh, how? When I left the room just now to talk to Mrs. Hudson, I was intending to tell her to summon some of my band of street urchins. You know, the Baker Street Irregulars. When she informed me that half a dozen of them were in the kitchen at this very moment, partaking of one of her incomparable steak and kidney pies, the rest should be obvious. You left instructions for one of them to shadow Mr. Layton when he left her. Elementary, my dear Watson. Oh, don't tell me that Layton back again. No, I think not. I should say that at the moment he's just about to walk out of the front door. No, I think we shall have another visitor. And judging by the commotion, the incoming and the outgoing visitors know each other and are not on the best of terms. Well, it sounds to me as if they're having a fight. Here comes Mrs. Hudson to tell us about it. Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you've got another visitor. Uh, so I gathered. Mrs. Hudson, you gave my instructions to one of the boys? I did that, sir. Young Wiggins was going to follow the gentleman. Well, Mrs. Hudson, what was all that commotion about downstairs just now? Oh, it was the two gentlemen shouting at each other. Him that was leaving and the one that was waiting on the doorstep. And who is our new visitor, Mrs. Hudson? Here's his card, sir. Oh, thank you. Linton Chumley, 9 Belgrave Square. Well, ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Very well, Mr. Holmes. Oh, one thing more. Yes, sir. Uh, please instruct another of the Baker Street Irregulars to follow this Linton Chumley when he leaves here and report to me. All right, sir. Hmm. You're taking no chances, Holmes, huh? You're having this fellow shadow, too. Leighton is a potential murderer. Of that I'm convinced. This Mr. Chumley might possibly be his intended victim. While we are talking to him, Watson, old fellow, I want you to be sure to look at the condition of his eyes. I certainly will. Come in. Oh, good evening, Mr. Chumley. How are you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Uh, that was Wayne Layton that was just left here, uh, wasn't it? Now, won't you sit down, sir? Uh, thank you. I don't want to sit down. All right. You needn't answer my question, but I know it was Layton. I've never met him, but I've seen his picture in the newspapers. Oh, very well, then, sir. It was Wayne Layton. Ah, I know why he came to you. He's, he's trying to have me put out of the way while he closes that deal on the San Pedro and Guana concession. Now, look here, Holmes. You've got to be on my side. Whatever fee he offered you to dispose of me, I'll double it if you'll take care of him for a few days. Oh, dear me, this is becoming monotonous. Watson, the hat and gloves? Thank you, old chap. That's right. Good night, Mr. Chumley. Uh, look here, Holmes. I'll, I'll treble his fee. I'll quadruple it. My dear Mr. Chumley, I have accepted no fee from Mr. Layton. I don't propose to accept one from you. Your hat and gloves, sir? Uh, that man is out to kill me, Holmes. Well, if you won't help me, I'll go to the police. That's an excellent idea, Mr. Chumley. Again, good night. Did you notice his eyes, Watson? Yes, the pupils were contracted. He's obviously an opium addict. And also a potential corpse. What do we do now? Wait for the irregulars to report? No, you'll return home for your medical bag. I have a feeling that you'll need it before the night is out. Then come back here. If I've gone before you return, I'll send one of the irregulars to bring you to wherever I may be. 
Wait until you receive a message from me. On your way, old chap. There's work ahead of us. Wiggins, you're certain that this is the place that Mr. Holmes told you to bring me to? Oh, yes, Dr. Watson. The corner of Swanham Line and Brixel Street, Mr. Holmes said. Well, this is the spot, all right. I don't see any sign of him. Hello? This old woman coming towards us. <laughs> so that's the disguise he chose. Oh, spare me a few coppers, will you, mister? <laughs> My feet are something awful, and I had a bite of food all day. Oh, no. No, you don't know, you... Can't fool me this time. As a matter of fact, your makeup isn't very convincing. You hardly look like a woman, and nobody's nose could be quite as red as that. Don't look like a woman, don't I? <laughs> My nose is too red, is it? I'll take that. Oh, no, steady, look at that. Making fun of a poor old woman who's plighted me. I, I'm sorry, fun. madam. I, I didn't mean to insult you. <laughs> well, Mary, she gave you a bit of work for all right, didn't she? Ah, box your ears. No mistake about it. You mind your own business. <laughs> and anyhow, why aren't you aboard your ship at this time of night? Because I'm not a sailor, Watson. It's Mr. Holmes. Great heavens, Holmes. I wish you you wouldn't confuse me like this. I'd never have recognized you. My dear Watson, when you're able to recognize me, it will indeed be the beginning of the end. When your eagle eye penetrates my disguise, I shall realize that my retirement is imminent. But enough of this. See that house opposite? You mean the ramshackle place with the broken tiled roof? Yes, I gave the irregulars instructions to let me know at once... If our two quarries ever enter the same house at the one time, they're inside there now. And I'm going in after them. Be careful, Holmes. I'd better come along with you. Can't I come to you, Mr. No, Holmes? No, certainly not. We'll keep watch outside. If I need any help, I'll smash one of the windows, and then you can come in after me. Wait here for me. I don't expect I'll be very long. But... I'll be here, Holmes. Don't worry about me. Just take good care of yourself. <laughs> One o'clock, Doctor. Yes, I know, Wiggins. He's been in there half an hour. I'm beginning to get worried. Start going off, No, 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 Wiggins. You know Mr. Holmes. When he gives orders, he likes some... (laughs) There's a signal for help. Keep watching the house, Wiggins. I'll be out in five minutes. Go for the police. Right, sir. All right, Holmes, all right. I'm coming. You have searched my house from basement to attic. Why do you not give up? I tell you again, there has been no one here tonight. But my friend came in here half an hour ago. I saw him. And before that, two other men are known to have come in here. Uh, If that is so, then where are they? Three men cannot vanish. That's just the point, you scoundrel. Out of the way. I'm going to search this hovel again. I'm not leaving here until I find Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. And if you don't mind, I'll take that second to say just one word to the ladies. And that word is muscatel. Petri, California, muscatel. I want you women to know about it because Petri muscatel is one wine that practically every woman likes. Maybe because it's such a beautiful color, like pale gold. But I guess really because Petri Muscatel brings you the wonderful flavor of luscious, sun-ripened Muscat grapes. And that's a flavor. Try Petri Muscatel after dinner, or any time as a change from Petri Port. Remember, if it's a Petri wine, you know it's a good wine. And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story... The eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, what happened next, Doctor? When you searched the house for the second time, did you find any trace of Sherlock Holmes or the two rival businessmen? No, Mr. Bartell, I'm afraid I didn't. What did you do? I told Wiggins to report the matter to the nearest police station and then rattle back to Baker Street in a handsome cab as fast as I could. When I arrived at the old familiar doorstep, I wrenched at the bell in a frenzy of anxiety. Finally, the door opened, and there stood Mrs. Hudson. Dr. Watson, what is it, sir? Why, you're as white as a ghost. Mr. Holmes, is he here? I sir. Came in half an hour ago. He was dressed as a sailor and was half carrying some drunken friend of his. Oh, thank heavens he's safe. I'll go up. All right, sir. Now, what's no chat? There you are. Holmes, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Who's that uh, 
at lying on the sofa. Well, I'll be back, Watson. Though I'm afraid the poor devil's done for. Great Scott, it's Wayne Layton, the American fella. With a knife wound between his ribs. See what you can do for him, will you? All right. This is extraordinary, Holmes. You said that Layton was a potential murderer. And now he's a victim himself. The bite a bit, eh, old chap? Yes, he's still breathing, but he, he hasn't a chance. I'll try him with an injection of strychnine. Holmes, how did you get his body out of the house? I, I searched the place from top to bottom. I, I found no trace of any of you. When I went in, I found the stabbing had already taken place. The proprietor then bribed me, or rather the broken-down cellar he took me for, to smuggle the body out through the secret stairway leading to the walls of the back of the house. Oh, there's no trace of Chumley there? No, he must have left before me by the same exit. Well, then you smashed the window and bolted. Yes, I knew that I could count on you to hold the fort while I was getting the body away. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Let's try to say something, Watson. I, yes, the injection's beginning to take effect. Uh, yes, Mr. Layton? What are you trying to say? Uh, tell us who stabbed you, uh, sir. Shh, shh, shh. Lips are moving. Uh, my, uh, my, Mandalay. He's dead, Holmes. Yes, but he gave us the clue to the murderer's identity. How? The word he mumbled just before he died. Sounded to me as if he said Mandalay. Precisely, old fellow. Never did a corpse give us a clearer instruction as to our next and final move. And that is? Back to Limehouse, Watson. Back to Limehouse. Here we are. This must be the place. What's this? Another opium den? Yes, I knew that since Chumley refrained from smoking earlier on in the night, in order to keep his faculties alert for murder, that an enormous reaction would set in. He'd have to find a den at once, and beyond question, a different one from that in which the murder was committed. But how do you know that he's inside here? Well, just before you returned to Baker Street tonight, I had a message from one of my irregulars. He tracked him here after he escaped from the scene of the stabbing. That was a couple of hours ago. He might have slipped away again. No, but since tonight he came to drown his senses with a wretched drug. He'll be here. Come on. Uh, that second injection of caffeine should bring him round. He's heavily drugged, but I think it'll work. Surprising what a five-pound note will do, isn't it? Yes, the proprietor let us bring Chumley into his private room and he... <laughs> he he's coming too. Oh, who, who, who are you? Who, what, what do you want? You remember me, sir? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Oh, uh, yes, yes, I, I remember you. You are in serious trouble, Mr. Chumley, very serious trouble. Uh, trouble... What what trouble? Wayne Layton didn't die. Oh. He's badly wounded, but he's going to live. He's at Baker Street now. He wants to go to the police and give evidence. You, you've got to get me out of this, Holmes. I'll, I'll pay you anything. Uh, Ten thousand, twenty thousand. Why did you stab Layton? He, he was in my way. I wanted the San Pedro concession. I, I meant to kill him, but we can fix it up now, can't we, Holmes? We can fix it up yes, now? Yes, we can fix it beautifully, sir. As neat a murder confession as ever I listened to, Holmes. Exactly. Come along, Mr. Chumley. I think some night air will be good for you. We'll take you for a nice drive to Scotland Yard. some kippers, gentlemen. You've both been up all night, and I'm sure you can do it. It's very thoughtful of you, Mrs. Watson. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, What is Mrs. Watson going to say when she finds you've been out all night? Don't you worry about that, Mrs. Hudson. She's very understanding. (laughs) It's lucky for you that she is. Well, I'll go and leave you to your breakfast. Holmes. Yes, dear fellow? There's only one thing that puzzles me about this case. Oh, what's that? When Leighton was dying, he muttered the word Mandalay. How did that give you the key to the murderer's identity? Oh, the dead American had never met Mr. Chumley, you remember, except when they bumped into each other in our hallway. Yes, he told us that he recognized him from the newspaper photographs. Being an American, he had no reason to know that the name Chumley is in no way pronounced the way it is spelt. But you had never thought of that. Chumley. That name spelt C-H-O-L, Chow, M-O-N, Mon, D-E-D-E-L-E-Y. Chal Mondele. Mondele. Precisely, old fellow. What you thought of the Mandalay was really Chal Mondele. 
The name of the murderer. What an amazing case. You did a remarkable job, Holmes. <laughs> I'm, I'm beginning to be confoundedly sleepy. Yeah, why not sleep, old chap? Your old uh, room's all ready for you. Are you going to take a nap? Oh, dear me, no. Hmm? I have much too busy a day ahead of me. Let me look at my engagement book. Uh, Baxter Square murder. Mm-hmm. I put the police on the track. The Duchess of uh, Ferrers. And I've got her material. The princess who was about to run away from home. Good gracious me, let her run. The Pope's cameos. Ah, yes, yes. His holiness must not be kept waiting. Uh, can uh, can I help you again, Holmes? Uh, Mary doesn't return un- <laughs> until tomorrow. Well, I thought you were a sleepy, old fellow. Sleepy rubbish. I never felt more wide awake in my life. <laughs> That was a swell story, Doctor. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And it was really funny when you mistook that old lady for Holmes and she slapped your face. It wasn't very funny at all. (laughs) Ah, sure it was. Come on, admit it, Doctor. Well, she did look like Holmes in disguise, you know, and you would have made the same mistake that I did. Okay, okay. Her nose was ridiculously red and she did look like a man. Uh, Look, Doctor, forget I ever said anything. I I won't say another word. I'll keep my mouth closed forever. Oh, come on, I wouldn't do that. Mr. Bartell? Mr. Bartell? Uh, won't you even open your mouth to uh, finish your wine? Your your Petri wine? Okay, you win. You know I'll open my mouth for Petri wine any time. That Petri wine is always good wine. And for good reason, too. The Petri family has always owned and operated the Petri business. They've been making fine wines for three generations, since way back in the 1800s. That adds up to a lot of experience. Experience handed on down from father to son... From father to son. The Petri family really knows how to turn luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And that's why, no matter what kind of wine you want, I'm sure you'll like it better if it's a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story are you going to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that Holmes and I had in the heart of the English countryside. It concerns a corpse, a missing revolver, and a beautiful girl who was frightened of her own shadow. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Man with the Twisted Lip. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. And Mr. Bruce, through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios... This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.